Good afternoon and welcome to this evidence session from the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Uh, before I introduce our witness for this afternoon's session, uh, a brief word of introduction on the committee itself and the review that we are currently undertaking. The committee was established in 1994 by the then Prime Minister, Sir John Major, to advise the Prime Minister on arrangements for upholding ethical standards of conduct in public life. And it was the committee under Lord Nolan who first articulated the seven principles of public life, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. And these set out universal standards for conduct in public life, and we continue as a committee to own and promote those principles. We're not a regulator. We do not field complaints or comment on the outcome of individual cases, but we do advise the Prime Minister and the government of the day on processes, procedures, and regulation in place to, hold high to uphold high standards uh, throughout the whole of public life in this country. For the committee's 25th anniversary in 2019, we decided to commission a piece of work from uh, an academic on the tapestry of uh, standards bodies that have grown up in the country over the last 25 years. And following that, to launch a review, analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of our current standards arrangements. This is something that the committee had done previously, most recently in 2013 with our standards matter report. Uh, and we are aiming to take an overlook, overview of how well ethical standards are upheld in public life, looking for any potential gaps or weaknesses. Uh, and we are also intending to produce some best practice guidance. I'm delighted that we are hearing this afternoon from Sir Bernard Jenkin MP, who for nine years oversaw the Standards Landscape as Chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Uh, and he is now the chair of the Liaison Committee, uh, which takes evidence regularly from the Prime Minister. And from the committee side today, I'm joined by Dame Shirley Pierce and Dr. Jane Martin, who are independent members of the committee. We're hoping particularly to hear Sir Bernard's views on ministerial code, on the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, and on the Public Appointments System. Uh, we are live streaming this session on our YouTube uh, uh, channel. And I would remind anybody who is watching that this committee is not asking about any recent or past cases uh, or any litigation which is continuing in the courts. Welcome, Sir Bernard. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, can, I, can I start by asking you just to reflect on the way in which we address public standards in this country, because there are a variety of ways in which you can do that. You can do it through exhortation, you can do it through uh, administration, or you can do it through legislation. Uh, and different countries do different things, and there are, are different ways, even in this country, that we address this. From your experience over a long period, what do you think are the the, the best ways of encouraging and ensuring that we get the highest public uh, standards in public life? Well, um, I'm very interested in the, the three means you identify, because there is a fourth means uh, that perhaps we don't tap into enough. It's uh, understanding what people in leadership positions feel and think about their own values and who they believe they are in terms of their own values. And there's no point in exhorting people to do things if they don't really understand what you're exhorting them to do, or they think you're exhorting them to um, apply values or standards which appear to have no relevance to the circumstances that they face in their and in, in the, the conflicts that leaders always face uh, when they're dealing with matters of uh, power and money and other other people's uh, destinies, if you like, other people's fates. Uh, so I, I think we need to have some fresh thinking. I w um, having read your um, Hugh K lecture, uh, the history of the evolution of standards regulation in this country uh, could be seen in a different light. That in fact, before uh, the Nolan Committee came into existence, 
um, there was an assumption about what standards were expected that had come through public school, Oxbridge colleges, uh, the armed forces, uh, the churches, a Sunday school, uh, uh, the things that were embedded in a, in a society, which today certainly uh, is not recognizable. And we started to have, make, have to make explicit what had always previously been assumed to be implicit. And then the growth of all these standards regulatory bodies has in fact um, limited the responsibility uh, of those in power uh, well, their sense of their sense that they are responsible, they have kind of contracted out uh, these responsibilities to these extra bodies and these extra sets of rules. So these are things they no, need to no longer worry about. I mean, I often wonder um, how the Civil Service Commission has changed the nature of the role of Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Civil Service, because the Civil Service Commission now takes care of certain things that were the responsibility of the head of the civil service. And it can be the, the same in other spheres that um, uh, the fact that there was, or there is, or should be, an independent advisor on ministerial interests has sort of taken away the responsibility of the prime minister to make that one of his primary focuses of his leadership. Um, so there is clearly an, a necessity for um, uh, rules and regulation and codes, um, but we must be mindful that we don't actually crowd out uh, what is the primary uh, driver of values in our society, which is people in leadership positions setting the right example because they want to. I find that a very attractive approach. How does one actually make that operate in the very pressurised political environment that, uh, that politicians and indeed civil servants operate in today? Um, well, that's a very good question. I mean, there is an extraordinary lack of emphasis on one of the uh, seven principles of public life, leadership. Uh, nobody is allowed to really to talk about much, about much about leadership. The, the Chancellor of the Duchess of Lancaster's whole critique of the civil service hardly mentioned leadership. And um, uh, one of the things that has happened recently is that the, um, the National Leadership Academy or National Leadership Center that was being formed has been thrown into the air again and uh, um, is going to be included into something called the Government Skills and Curriculum Unit, which doesn't instantly inspire much about much thinking about leadership. Um, and we live in a, a, a culture where it is assumed that you are either a leader or you're not. Um, when in fact, uh, in, in no other walk of life do we expect um, the most talented people simply to emerge. Um, if you're going to be a great concert pianist, um, you might be very talented, but you're not going to get there unless you have a lot of lessons and practice a lot. And it's the same uh, if you're actually not very talented at playing the piano, you can have a lot of lessons and you can be a perfectly competent pianist, if not a very inspiring one. So there are lots of people in leadership positions who could have their uh, leadership capabilities improved um, and perhaps lots of very good leaders who could become even better leaders if they were, if they were, if it was accepted that you should talk about what it is to be a leader and to understand more about leadership. And of course, intrinsic to leadership is the example you set. Um, and I think we've become careless in our culture that uh, somehow getting the job done and being seen to succeed, whatever success is, is seen to be far more important than uh, uh, the example you set through the way you live your values. And too often leaders betray their, um, their true values um, as they scramble to succeed. And we see that in business, we see that in public life, uh, we see that in all walks of life. So I would suggest that we need two things. One is to talk much more openly about leadership. And secondly, to um, create safe spaces where there can be many more conversations amongst leaders and potential leaders, where they can talk about what sort of example they should set. And this shouldn't be seen as a sort of um, 
preachy lecture about what values you should adopt, uh, um, it should be seen as an empowering thing because my experience in public life is the vast majority of people have good values or aspire to good values, um, but they're told they're being a bit prissy if they talk about them. Um, I have once been accused of being pious. I don't consider myself to be a pious person at all. But um, uh, the uh, Westminster Abbey Institute actually gave evidence to the Standards Committee just very recently. And we were told how MPs are invited to come and talk about ethics and standards. And they, they reluctantly refuse because they fear that if it's found out they've been taking part in the discussion about ethics and standards, they will be ridiculed on social media and found out for some thing they've done wrong and they will be branded a hypocrite. Um, so it's almost a taboo subject. Um, and uh, I find myself sometimes sitting in a tea room in the House of Commons or uh, at a dining table uh, talking about these things, but um, finding that if you can find the right language, people are very interested to talk about this, particularly younger um, uh, colleagues, because whereas the older colleagues are rather set in their ways and come from a, an era where values were more easily assumed, um, the younger colleagues, uh, I think they're much more idealistic. I think um, if I can touch on the, on the, on the issue of, um, of, of the next generation, I mean, their enthusiasm for values and things of value, they really, they really mind about uh, values and, and, and good behavior. Um, but we need to include them in this conversation uh, in a way that they perhaps feel excluded by the rather stuffy old farts who think that values are, are just accepted and we don't need to talk about them. So that I think there's bridges to be built across the generations. Uh, it's, and it's not exhortation, it's about offering support and space uh, for the reflection that I think a lot of people hunger for. I think that's, I think that's an extremely important uh, perspective do you distinguish this between what you know from, from what used to be called the good chap theory of public administration, or is this a, a modernized version of that to try to encourage good chaps and presumably chapesses uh, in the current generation? Well, I think there was a bit of um, there was a bit of a London club approach uh, about the good chap theory of good administration, which is certainly outdated, um, uh, and it is certainly much more of a challenge finding. Um, common language to express values uh, in um, a society which comes from far more diverse um, uh, religious and ethnic backgrounds. And of course, um, and that we're not all men anymore. Uh, we're very much women as well. And also where um, uh, you're, you know, there is an ultra liberalism about where you basically are allowed to choose whatever values you want and nobody can gainsay that. And in fact, if anybody does gainsay that, you deserve to be given a safe space because um, uh, you need to be protected from people who are limiting your idea of what, you, what values you want to adopt. And, um, uh, and that, that kind of extreme liberalism also becomes a kind of new form of oppression if it's allowed to take root. And we've seen that in some of the universities. So we're in very fraught, difficult waters here, but what I think is, um, quite an easy concept is the idea that out of the limelight of public scrutiny uh, and the glare of publicity, uh, uh, people should be drawn together to talk about their experiences and what they aspire to in their personal and professional lives um, so that they can strengthen each other and realize that there are plenty of kindred spirits out there who are thinking the same things as they are and that we can create a more public discourse arising from that private, those private conversations. So this is, as it were, exploration rather than exhortation. It is reflection, I think is the word I would use. Yeah. Um, uh, leaders in public life very rarely get time for reflection. Um, but the strongest organizations in public life actually do give that space for reflection, whether we're talking about the security services or the armed forces or um, uh, but perhaps not so much the civil service, maybe the civil service. I mean, I, I think it was a very sad, sad demise of the National School for Government, where I think a certain amount of that reflection uh, was intended to take place. Um, but I think we need to institutionalize 
um, much more reflection, much more reflective learning. It's one of the forms of learning that is very easily neglected. We do lots of instructional learning. We do lots of learning on the job. Um, and um, in some spheres, like in computing or systems acquisition, we look at experimental learning. That's very important. Um, but reflective learning is possibly the most important because it's in reflection that we will learn how to make better judgments. The, the British standard system, in, in, in its sort of pragmatic way, has uh, developed uh, piecemeal over decades. Uh, and the resulting landscape is, to say the least, fragmented and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that that is good because it reflects the needs of specific organisations and communities? Or do you think that it's a weakness and that there needs to be greater simplicity and or centralization? Well, given that um, one of the driving purposes of having standards regulation is to provide the public with confidence, if these systems of codes and uh, adjudication of codes under rules is not simple and transparent, uh, then I think the public begin to lose faith uh, that there is proper oversight. I mean, the classic example here is where the ministerial code is not as, as rigorously applied as it might be, and uh, the public feel there are issues to raise, and they write letters to the Parliamentary Commission for Standards because the minister in question is a member of parliament, and the Parliamentary Commission for has to say, well, it's nothing to do with me, it's the ministerial code. Um, and you know, it's something I'm personally wrestling with as we review our code in the House of Commons on the Standards Committee is um, to what extent is the failure to apply the ministerial code a sad reflection on the way uh, on the House of Commons reputation um, and that I think that's I think it reflects badly on all the politics um, and therefore it should, perhaps should be a responsibility of the Standards Committee in the House of Commons as well but um, that's, that's fairly explosive <laughs> uh, it, it's a matter that was touched on this morning when we were talking to Sir Alex Allen, um, but fortuitously that opens the the way to Dr Jane Martin, who I think would like to talk about the ministerial code. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lord Evans. Uh, yes, um, Sir Bernard. So um, to bring us, um, I don't want to say down to the specifics, but um, uh, we would like to hear your views, particularly on the ministerial code. Um, and I've got a few questions, but perhaps I can just start quite generally in asking you, you know, how successful do you think the current arrangements are um, in regulating ministerial conduct? And I suppose I would add holding ministers to account. Well, um, in the period I was chair of the committee, I would describe them as never having been particularly satisfactory. Um, and that is because there were a number of cases under David Cameron where... Um, he asked the cabinet secretary to investigate them and they decided there was no reason for the independent advisor to investigate them as well. Um, and that seemed to me rather like second guessing the independent advisor. And we complained about that a lot. And uh, the, the conclusion that we came to was, of course, the independent advisor should be able to choose their own inquiries. But that turns the code into a the ministerial code into a very different beast. Um, and I don't think I really appreciated that at the time. Um, and um, the, the, uh, the other thing that I think is, I think was touched upon again this morning, um, that the code grew out of um, a very, very different kind of document. It grew out of something called the um, um, questions of procedure for ministers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in which there used to be the phrase, in such circumstances, a minister would be expected to resign. Well, you know, that in the private space of the secret um, manual for ministers that used to exist before the ministerial code, uh, there would have been space to say, well, <laughs> yes, well, that was very bad and we'll make sure that never happens again. I, there was space for learning and improvement without the Damascene sword of resignation falling on the hapless minister. And uh, I think... Uh, Sir Alex said this morning, there should be a spectrum of, of available things for the Prime Minister to do in response. Now, in a case of, of, of bullying, um, without referring to anybody in particular, um, uh, 
bullying can only be defined in terms of not just the, per the behavior of the person accused of bullying, but the perception of the person who felt they were being bullied. So it's a very, very subjective question. And um, uh, in any situation of that nature, one would want to try and resolve it and improve the behavior rather than let it fester and blow up and then become a binary question as to whether uh, one of the great offices of state should be vacated uh, in the middle of a political crisis. Um, that seems to be um, a shortcoming of the way the code operates at the moment. And I think if we were going to give the independent advisor um, genuine independence to self-start their own inquiries, which I think is necessary, I think we'd need to completely rethink the, ministry, the ministerial code so it ceases to be um, a, a remnant of the uh, questions of procedure and it, it stands alone as a, as a clear code of conduct. Thank you. And, uh, I mean, you've really touched on the key issues for us there. I wonder if we might just unpick it a little bit. So, I mean, do I take it from what you said that in terms of sanctions that, uh, well, maybe the things hang together, which is exactly what you've just said, i.e., you know, if there, if there is to be greater ind independence in the health process, i.e., for the advisor to uh, initiate their own investigations. Uh, and indeed, you know, there should be greater in independence uh, generally around the code, because it does at the moment lag behind, of course, what was being introduced in Parliament. So there is a question, I think, there's a, a, a legitimate question about independence and how that plays through the arrangements of the ministerial code. Uh, but I think what you were saying is, well, if that, you know, that's something you've called for in the past, um, it'd be interesting to know if you are still in favour of this greater independence. And if so, I, do I take it that you're linking that uh, explicitly with a range of sanctions as well? Well, I, I, in the end, we've got this constitutional fact uh, that if a minister commands the confidence of the House of Commons, um, then uh, that minister can stay in office. And um, But it's a great shame if that trumps everything else and sidelines everything else. There should still be an obligation and an opportunity to sort things out um, while respecting that constitutional and political reality. Um, it's a messy business, but power is. <laughs> and so, sorry, just to press you once more then, so, but greater independence would would be a good thing within oh, those yes. processes? I'm sorry, I said yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I, I, that was my expectation. I just wanted to be sure that I'd understood. Um, and on the same point about the, well, not on, on the point of the um, independent advisor, um, again, going to the same point about independence, uh, do you think the appointments process for the advisor at the moment is satisfactory? Uh, it, it's, it seems to um, lack formality, I, I think is perhaps one way of putting it. Um, uh, you know, would, would, there, would you like to see that strengthened in any way? Well, it's not covered by the uh, Public Appointments Commission. Indeed. And maybe there's an argument that it should be. Um, but the relationship between the Prime Minister and the independent advisor is clearly a very important one, and that has to be one of confidence and trust. And I don't think the Prime Minister has got time to sit on a panel. Um, uh, but maybe a panel should pre-select um, um, respective candidates. That doesn't stop the tap on the shoulder asking so-and-so if they will apply. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, so I, I don't think that I don't think the appointment of the advice has been an issue. I mean, we made a, a you know, you know, how were you asked to do the job, Sir Alex? Um, a question when I was in. Yeah. The um, um, I think it, it 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 strengthens the credibility and independence of the advisor if there is a more transparent and independent influence. But I don't think that's been the issue in this particular instance. I see. Thank you. So, well, I mean, just person, I'm... the way the person conducts themselves in the office is the proof of the pudding, isn't it? Of course, I'm sure. Um, uh, and so, I mean, just just finally on this one, then, are there any other reforms that you would propose to the regulation of the ministerial code? Are there any other changes that you would like to see that you feel would be helpful? Well, I as I say, I think the, the, the spectrum of, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's very binary at the moment. If you breach the code, you resign. If you don't breach the code, everything's fine. Well, that's clearly not how life is. Yeah. Um, and, well, it's a very long document. Um, um, uh, you know, is it a set of principles or is it a set of rules? Um, the old question. But I come back to this point 
um, you only resort to the rules when somebody has lost sight of the principles or there is a, there is a belief that somebody's lost sight of the principles. What you want amongst ministers is a far more ready discussion or by the time they become a minister. So this needs to happen to MPs when they're still young and they're prospective ministers. They need to be drawn into these conversations and, and thought about, and uh, you know, not, uh, not just about, um, I'm afraid I'm going to make a criticism of the, of the lecture, um, Jonathan, about, um, you know, it's, that, that it's not just, that it has a utilitarian value or a contractual quality, the seven principles. Um, uh, but by reflecting on the seven principles, they will help future leaders find out who they really are, what sort of person and what sort of leader you really are, and what sort of example you want to set. Um, at least you may not be very good when you get to your position of leadership, but at least you'll have had an opportunity to reflect upon it, which I think uh, um, very few who become ministers have had. And I'll just add something else. As, um, in my very recent experience, there's been... Um, a number of new people joining the number 10 uh, body of special advisors. One of them said to a friend recently uh, how she was absolutely flabbergasted that there was no continuous professional development for special advisors whatsoever. None. Um, and, and these are people that, out of which there are likely to be quite a number of uh, MPs and ministers in the future. You know, we, we have a very odd way of training our future national leaders in a way that we would never tolerate in any of the organizations for which we are held accountable. Yeah, um, uh, I just, I'd just like to uh, uh, finish with one sort of supplementary, if I may. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, about the importance of the public being able to see their way through a system and not that they necessarily would follow the route, but they need to be able to understand. You talked about the potential for confusion. And, um, and I'm also very interested in what you're saying about having a, you know, a range of sanctions and indeed the space, uh, not only for, you know, what I would term proper induction, but also to reflect on misdemeanors, shall I call it. And, well, and, 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 and charge on that for a second, the space for learning from experience. Yes. We all make mistakes. Uh, we all make bad judgments. And there should be an opportunity to invite people to, uh, and maybe a group of people who've been in disagreement, to together reflect on what went wrong and why they got into disagreement so that they can improve their performance in the future. Uh, instead, we finish up firing people who just gained the experience we really wanted them to have. Of course, uh, and uh, completely, completely understand that point, uh, which is which is a good point. I, my, my sort of my slight challenge back to you would be, well, you know, is that going to uh, maintain or restore, uh, depending on your point of view, the public confidence that we need, which is in at the end of the day in the in the government and in our key politicians um, uh, who, um, you know, let's say expect something to be done. I mean, I, I wonder how you would react to that. Well, I think people expect something to be done uh, in order to prevent it happening again. Uh, I, I think a succession of public executions doesn't necessarily uh, inspire much confidence. Yeah. Um, particularly as, in, in terms of confusion, uh, so often the person that's been forced to resign is back in the government a couple of years later, as though, you know, having to resign because you breached the ministerial code is just one of those hazards of public life. You resign, everyone gets over it and you come back. Um, that doesn't seem, that doesn't inspire much public confidence. Thank you. No, th thank you very much for that. I think that those are my questions for now. Thank you. I think it's uh, Shirley now. Yes. Sir so Bernard, uh, thank you very much. Um, can we turn to business appointments and the process that's in place uh, at the moment, which you've been very close to about the regulation of, of business appointments? And in your report on ACABA, um, you described it as a toothless regulator which has failed to change the environment around business appointments. Um, and I, I was keen to get a sense of whether you feel that's being picked up and responded to um, and whether it's still your view um, and what the current greatest risks around the way we oversee business appointments for minister, ex-ministers and ex-civil servants who, who clearly um, have a, a lot of interesting experience and knowledge which the outside world would like. Um, this is a very difficult 
uh, and vexed issue. Um, but it is um, clearly an arrangement at the moment that does not inspire public confidence. And indeed, it is loathed by people who are trying to navigate their way out of their role in public life into a, a perfectly respectable uh, a job in the private sector. Um, because um, perversely, um, if you go to the Akaba and say, I think you're taking the job, they say, oh, I really wouldn't take that job. Nothing appears. Uh, if you go to them and say, I'm really thinking of taking this job, and they say, yes, that could be fine if you did the following undertakings. So then they publish the correspondence and you're pilloried in the press uh, because it's advertised in a way that, um, uh, that somehow you're legging it over the system. Uh, secondly, there's a big problem in that the, um, and this has changed a little bit in the tone of the letters the, that Akaba writes. And I, ha I have no criticism to make of the individuals in the chair of Akaba at all, because um, it, I think it's a thankless task. But um, uh, they now write letters like, um, that include the phrase, we do not think this will perceive to be a reward for past um, um, actions in your role in government or whatever. Um, well, I think that's, that underlines what the problem really is, that if every former chancellor is offered a job with BlackRock, uh, if every former, um, actually this is, I think, true, if every former European Commission president that becomes a, a vice president of Goldman Sachs, one might be forgiven thinking that they would be looking over their shoulder um, uh, while they were doing their job, wondering what they might be doing in a few years' time when they cease their job in public office. And if you translate this to, say, all the contractual relationships man but managed by ministers and officials um, in Whitehall, I mean, the Ministry of Defence is, is, is a, a very strong case in point. Um, we need to have a much more open conversation about the fact that, um, you know, if you're managing a capita contract, uh, when you leave jo that job, uh, you know, in two years' time, you're then a director of capital. That's a bit of a problem um, because it looks like um, your experience, it's not just your experience being used, it is, um, and not that you and, and the, there's a blind spot. You know, it's this obsession that you mustn't do any lobbying, um, you mustn't use your contacts. Well, actually, if you were using your contacts, that would be fairly transparent. Um, um, uh, and nobody can define what lobbying is anyway. Um, that's an impossible uh, activity to define. Uh, the problem is not lobbying. The problem is that um, you are actually being rewarded for something you did when you were conducting your role, or you didn't, you didn't take action against the contractor when you perhaps should have done. You know, it, it's, the, you know, it, it, it's, I'm very uncomfortable with this, and I don't know how to resolve it, except that uh, it's about inculcating the values into people. I mean, I'm going to brag a bit about my, my late father. Uh, when he left politics, uh, he was offered something and he said, I really don't think I can take that. And I said, why not? Um, it wouldn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And okay, that's possibly why I am how I am as well. But um, if only more people were able to think like that, um, maybe that's a different era, I don't know. But that is the problem with Akaba. It doesn't do that job. And it purports to be a regulator um, in the way that it's set up, but it's not a regulator. It's an advisory committee. So um, our, our recommendation was very much about heightening the moral awareness about the way people in public office are managed in their relationships with their private sector counterparts um, so that um, there is an awareness of, I, I don't suppose there's much talk about, except nudge, 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 oh, if you, get, if you go and manage that contract, they'll give you a job when you leave. Um, I mean, you, but that's the sense that one gets, which is very depressing. Mm. That's the only conversation that happens. Uh, and the examples you gave are at a sort of senior high-end um, examples, but is there at um, particularly more junior levels some benefit actually to you, because you were talking about personal development earlier on, about understanding the different worlds and how they work together and actually Absolutely. some more rotating, some culture in which it were okay to move more readily between the two. Is that something you'd like to, to see it aspiring to whatever the new regulatory system ar ar arrived at? 
Um, or or is, it, is it always a problem? No, I don't think it is always a problem. Uh, I think um, um, a lot of uh, um, emerging leaders in the civil service go and spend a period in the private sector. And I think that's extremely important. But of course, they're thinking about coming back and they wouldn't be put into a role which was immediately conflicting with a role that they had left or a role they might come into. So that can be managed more easily. Um, I thought you were going to say, does this problem happen much lower down the system as well? And yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, but if at senior level, the right example was being set and the right, um, um, the right sort of ethical, uh, the right behavior and the characteristics of behavior and attitude towards it were being inculcated and set, then it would, be, it would happen much less. Um, there would still need to be, in the end, a backstop of rules to be adjudicated. And of course, it's, adjudication is something ACABA doesn't do. If somebody breaches the ACABA rules, and uh, we came across, <laughs> I mean, it was a harmless case, but um, uh, Gus O'Donnell, uh, soon after he left the civil service, took on a role, excuse me, took on a role in which he should have, um, uh, in which he should have made a declaration to ACABA before, asked their permission before taking it. It was only a charitable role. But even he forgot in that circumstance, which um, un well, that's all on the record with the, in the committee and evidence. Uh, and uh, I think he would be the first to agree that um, uh, it's a very difficult job uh, to make this system work as it is at the moment. But on, what I have sadly found um, a, a huge resistance to confronting these issues with ACABA, simply because I think you've got a generation in office in their final jobs, and the last thing they want is some new rules to be brought in that are going to make it much more difficult for them to retire than their immediate predecessors. And that's very understandable as well, because part of the contract with senior civil servants in particular is you're not pay paid nearly as much as you would be paid if you were in the private sector. You, you do it as a vocation, but part of your reward is you will be able to earn when you retire at the age of 60, which is quite young. Uh, you will be able to use your experience in the private sector to, um, for your own benefit. That's part of the con implied contract that we have with our senior civil service. And this is seen as an interruption to that, a potential interruption to that implied contract. And I, I take what you, you say about it being a, about a change of culture, but what powers should ACABA have? I mean, it's, very, it's actually very hard to find examples of where the ACABA rules have been um, abused because I think it happens sort of quietly behind the scenes before. Oh, we don't know about it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I but think if it does happen, what powers should ACABA have? Well, I think the, um, the, 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 the I'm, I'm afraid it's some time since I read our ACABA report and we took, um, our second ACABA report was much better than the first one. In the first one, we recommended a legislative framework. And in fact, uh, that wouldn't begin to address um, the cultural shift that needs to happen. And that when we say culture, we're talking about attitude and behavior. That, that, you know, we need to call out there needs to be an atmosphere in the civil service in Whitehall that calls out certain attitudes and behaviours uh, and approves of the right attitudes, the right behaviours. That's the conversation and reflection that needs to generate that. Um, and we laid much more emphasis on that in our second report. But in terms of regulation, I think it should be very light touch to start with to see how we get on. But it does need to, I mean, we, you can't apply any restrictions on someone leaving a job beyond two, year, two years. I mean, that's just a matter of employment. Um, so I think the, the cultural um, and leadership question around this matter is much more important than, than rules and punishment and enforcement. But I would change the emphasis that um, uh, the rule, there is a case for a, a set of rules which you can consult your uh, own legal advisor privately about and to decide whether you are inside the rules. And if you're outside the rules, then the regulator should call you out. Um, actually, reputational damage in the vast majority of cases would be by far the biggest admonition if someone had, was thought to have breached rules and you certainly wouldn't get a job in an organization that wants to have a reputation mm. in, under those circumstances. Mm. And the, the current chair of ACABA is taking a much more public uh, and transparent the approach to this, which um, it sounds as if you would be very supportive of. I'm afraid I haven't been following it closely. Um, oh. I, I can't comment. Okay. And I'm very glad if, 
he or she is. I didn't know who it is at the moment. Pickles, Eric Pickles. Eric Pickles, yes, good, yes, of course. Can, can I, you mentioned lobbying. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned lobbying um, and said that this isn't really what this is all about and lobbying isn't so much, I think I heard you say that lobbying isn't so, something that we should be being so worried about people using their contacts. But I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say whether you think, say a bit more about that and whether you think there is a, a, an issue about lobbying, which we should be um, more alert to. Well, the thing about lobbying, the lobbying happens when the person is in office and they have the responsibility for that relationship with that body. Um, uh, um, I mean, there's been lots of comments about a former minister who made a major tax change when he was in office and then took a job with the company that was lobbying for the tax change. Um, uh, the lobbying takes place uh, while the minister is in office, not, not by the minister once they've left office. That's, that's the lobbying we should be worried about. And what do we do about that? Um, I think we need, first of all, we need to talk about it and accept that it's happening and um, um, create an atmosphere in government that um, uh, doesn't tolerate it. Um, but uh, I, I, it is a very difficult problem. But, but the idea that that um, uh, that uh, just this advisory committee, as it's operating at the moment, um, uh, is going to resolve the problem is it's not. Thank you very much. I'm not being incredibly clear, but um, I hope I'm being reasonable. Yeah, no, no, that's in incredibly helpful, and I shall hand back to Lord Evans. Thank you. Final questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could we touch on the question of public appointments? You, may, you warned in 2016 that the Grimstone Review threatened to demolish the safeguards in the public appointments regime established by Lord Nolan in, 20, in uh, 25 years before. Do you think that the outcome of the Grimstone Review has been as bad as you feared that it might be? Well, if you remember, there was um, some further work when we were in the process of appointing um, uh, of, um, uh, Sir Peter Riddle um, to that role and um, um, we quizzed him on this and we um, exceptionally gave him a second pre-appointment hearing in which he explained how he was going to address this and I think that was we did uh, redress quite a lot of the imbalance um, but it is a conundrum isn't it that um, uh, um, um, we appoint a civil service uh, on merit uh, and with a system that was designed to get rid of personal patronage and reward. And, um, and yet we have a system of public appointments which certainly grew up with that in mind and then was dealt with. Um, and yet a lot of these public appointments are almost quasi-ministerial in character in terms of the influence they have on public policy. Um, uh, I think I think the balance is about right. Um, I, I think in looking at this, uh, it needs to be understood. There's a there is a terrific imbalance in terms of certainly I speak as a conservative. There 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 is a feeling that there is a terrific imbalance that that very few conservatives or professed conservatives get roles in these public bodies. But many who've grown up in the quangocracy, uh, one might say the. Um, um, uh, they come from local government and uh, the, the, the voluntary sector and, I mean, all very good people, but they do seem to inhabit a particular view um, so that a conservative is rather rare. Uh, I think a lot of the frustration about this public appointments issue arises from that. And I think panels need to be, need to be and I'm sure they are, but they, they kind of uh, resent it when... Uh, a conservative uh, a minister says, oh no, you must interview this person. They find that rather difficult. I'm sure you've sat on a panel where that has happened. And, um, um, and yet that, that is the minister's right. And it is the minister's right to send them all back again at the end of it. By far the biggest problem about public appointments was the lack of ministerial attention given to ministerial appointments at the early stages. If the minister had read the job description before it had been issued, 
you know, they might have got the candidate they wanted, but they only take an interest when the file lands on their desk to make the appointment. Um, and they wonder why they don't get the people they want. So uh, I think it's a, the job of private offices to make sure ministers properly engage with the whole process. And, and, and if you get the job description right, and, the adver and, and you're satisfied with the way it's going to be advertised, um, and you have an opportunity to make sure that people, the sort of people you want to apply are tipped off so that they do apply, then as a minister, you're far more likely to finish up with the right person being offered to you. My impression from reading uh, Peter Riddle's letter as he moves towards the end of his term was that um, he feels that there is considerably more political um, interest being taken in the process than was the case historically. Uh, and that is the lesson. Um, and I think um, ministers have learned that lesson as well. Um, it's part of the art of, art of governing is to make sure that uh, if, if you follow the process, then you'll get the outcome. But if you don't take an interest in the process, you won't get the outcome. The other question that certainly Peter Riddle has raised and which we've also noted in, uh, in some of the correspondence that we've had has been the, uh, the fact that the public appointment system covers a certain set of jobs, but that there are uh, quite a large number of um, increasingly influential roles uh, in public life, which are not actually covered by the public appointments uh, rules. Does that seem to you to be appropriate? And there's been quite a lot of criticism of uh, one or two high profile cases where individuals have very influential roles, uh, but they are not covered by the Public Appointments Commission uh, procedures. Uh, and that, that looks anomalous, but do you think that there's an anomaly there? Uh, I do. I think it's very odd, for example, that the non-executive directors of department are completely outside the process. It's a purely political appointment by the minister. Um, uh, that's not to say there aren't very great many extremely capable um, non-executive directors of departments who have been appointed on that basis. Um, uh, but it is, it is open to abuse. Um, uh, one Secretary of State has a habit of clearing out the... Um, uh, as soon as he moves into another role, he clears out all the non-executive directors and brings in his pals. Um, I don't think that inspires much public confidence. It rather suggests that he doesn't really know how to run the department. <laughs> um, because uh, uh, I, I think this all comes down to leadership again and educating, um, educating prospective ministers on how to lead, which is not about uh, having enough... Um, troops at the top of the organization so you can bludgeon the organization into doing what you want. It is actually about explaining and engaging and inspiring. Um, and um, most civil servants will carry out instructions with, to which they are bitterly opposed personally if they know the minister trusts them and uh, the minister uh, believes in their capability and the minister depends upon what they do and they will be thanked and appreciated for what they do and not embarrassed or shamed in public. Um, please read the document, uh, the, the report we produced called The Minister and the Official, um, The Fulcrum of Effectiveness in Whitehall. I don't think nearly enough thought and reflection is given to the relationship between ministers and their officials. And yet it is at the heart of so much public appointments, yes. um, ethics and standards, uh, effectiveness of the civil service um, but it's one of the taboo subjects when we first mooted that we might do such an inquiry uh, there was an exclaim of horror from the then minister for the civil service that, that, that the idea that we should do such an inquiry was a total intrusion into their sort of private lives <laughs> um, but in fact we did a very worthwhile inquiry with the with the cooperation of ministers and the then cabinet secretary uh, Jeremy Hayward uh, to the extent the academics were using were absolutely astonished at how open the discussion was compared to how other discussions they'd had like that in the private sector, which shows that the public sector was so ready and willing to learn and change and is so much more adaptable in many respects than the private sector. And that's what we need to enhance for the future. Although I would say that I have been struck since I work in both sectors by the fact that what would be seen as best practice in the private sector and particularly where there are regulatory requirements, where there are uh, governance codes, etc., for public companies, um, that the approach that they take to uh, 
trying to have a disinterested and professional approach to issues is, is sometimes, it seems to me, somewhat ahead, actually, of what you see in the public, some parts of the public sector. Well, that's, I would say that's very encouraging. Um, we have a government that always says there's so much to learn from the private sector. Maybe they should be learning some of that. Um, we, we will be speaking to some private sector leaders in the context of this well, inquiry. I will, um, you remember that Sir Stuart Rose did a, an inquiry into the, into the health service uh, after the Lansley reforms. And he won't mind me saying so. Um, um, we, we, we met and discussed his report. And he just said, um, you see, it's about the people. I can't understand why they can't just see it. it's about the people. Um, and I think so much of politics is about policy. And uh, we have this curious obsession that somehow policy is different from everything else. Uh, private sector don't do policy. They just get on with stuff. And um, uh, policy and then implementation is separate. And uh, the other thing that, that um, is separate is somehow that um, uh, it's all about structures uh, and it's not about, hang on, how good are the people here? How good could they be if we led them and managed them differently and better? Um, and I think we need much more of that discussion. I am aware that we have touched on a number of areas of particular interest to us and your wider observations at the beginning, I think, were particularly valuable. Are there other areas that, in the light of the, uh, the terms of reference that you've seen, you would like to mention as we move towards the end? Um, uh, yes, I would. Um, and um, you are suitably reticent to criticise Parliament and the way we do things in Parliament. Um, and um, uh, But I, I do urge you to think about ways you can provide more support uh, to parliamentarians individually and collectively about how we grapple with these issues. Um, and in particular, uh, I'm very struck by how uh, complicated our system now is. Um, for, for an MP coming into the House of Commons, there are different sets of rules about uh, use of facilities, use of stationery, then there's the House of Commons Code of Conduct, and then there's the Behaviour Code. Uh, and, uh, and then if you become a PPS, uh, you're in the Ministerial Code. This is all very, very complicated. And um, there is a need for simplicity. Um, and in particular, uh, I think the, um, uh, the, the lesson of the behaviour code and the Me Too whole business of bullying and harassment, we finished up with a completely independent adjudication system for that. My view is that uh, we shouldn't be frightened of a, uh, an independent adjudication system for our House of Commons code. Um, and to expect MPs to sit in judgment on their own colleagues is an extraordinarily painful business and hopelessly conflicted um, and, uh, I, I, and antiquated and doesn't command public confidence. So if you were to look at the way we do things, uh, that would be my view. You should recommend that. Um, what can we learn from the behaviour code and the independent complaints and grievance system for the whole conduct of our code? to make it simpler. Should there be one code rather than two? Um, I mean, a behavior code and a code of conduct is just the same words for the same thing, though they do different things. Um, and we've now got a kind of um, um, a constituency of promoters of the behavior code who take a proprietorial interest in that code and don't want it messed up with our own House of Commons code. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, it's too complicated at the moment. And I think that's something, uh, if, if we want to have more conversations about what values really mean and how we're going to improve attitudes and behaviours, which is what culture is, then we need to make the codes themselves more sensible. And I applaud your, the direction of travel, which is towards more principles-based reg regulation and less emphasis on rules. If rules could solve the problem, then rules would have solved the problem by now, but rules on their own aren't going to solve the problem. Werner, thank you very, very much for your time. Very interesting uh, evidence, and we will reflect on it, as you suggest we should. Uh, and thank you very much for your contribution. Thank I'm you. I'm very honoured to have been invited. Thank you very much.